Okay. Yeah, Mike Russell is a so as associate associate minister, minister yes. yes. at right. St George's Anglican, okay. and he's That's the, at McGill. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And uh, Mike's going to talk to us on it's entitled intuition or something, isn't that? Oh, I call it no excuse intuitionism. It's an approach to apologetics. Yes, and it's a type of presuppositionalism, isn't it? I wouldn't call it that. No. <laughs> okay, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll hear about that. <laughs> All right. So, um, well, I'm, I'm happy to presuppose God's existence. Right. So, okay. you know, if you want to call that presuppositionalism, you can. All right. Good. So, Mike will speak to us probably around to around about eight o'clock. Or... I don't know what the time is. Right. Ten past seven. Yeah. Well, and... uh, I might not get quite that far. Yeah. That's sure. right. And then we'll open up for discussion, and I'm sure there will be some on what you have to say. Looking forward to that. Yes. I can already tell from some of the cheeky questions I've been getting just sitting yes. down there. Yeah. <laughs> We've heard people for things like this before. <laughs> oh, good. Well, this is stuck out there. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, like it could be fun. All right. Okay. So, thanks very much for coming along uh, to speak to us, and uh, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I became a Christian when I was about seventeen, and it happened because I went away from home. I left home and went across to Sydney and it was a great time in my life. I remember deciding that I thought I'd go to church. I never got to go to church with mum and dad being around just because, well, they didn't do it and I didn't feel like I could push them into it. So, But once I was off on my own, having left home, there were some really kind people who were in the college that I moved out to and they invited me to come to church. And that's because of their love and care, really, that I thought, yeah, I'll go along. And uh, I went along, and they were the nicest bunch of people I'd met up until then. Maybe the bar had been set a bit low. At school, at least. <laughs> but I, I kept going, and that was the reason. Their love and care that I was there in church, and then able to hear about Jesus, and why I needed Jesus. And that I needed him more because of my sin, that I needed him to die on the cross for my sins. And I opened that way, partly so you can get to know me a bit. Um, I left home with this cadetship from AMP to, and they were, AMP were paying me to go over to Sydney, <coughs> which was quite odd since my grandpa had gone to jail for embezzling money from the AMP. <laughs> <laughs> but they took me on anyway, and that was the reason I was able to go out there. And so I start that way partly so you can just get to know me a little bit. But also because we're about to talk for quite a while about apologetic method. But I want to start out by reminding us what we can often forget for those of us who are quite interested in apologetics and apologetic method like I am. Heck, I'm writing an MTH thesis on the subject. What we can easily forget is the importance of love and care in bringing people to a place where they're ready to hear about Jesus, ready to hear about, well, the apologetics and our method and the way we want to talk about Jesus and so on. So, here we are. Maybe I should pull back a bit here. I don't know if the video is still on it, but I'm going to need to be able to yep, that's touch cool. something. Does that help how this works? Yeah, I have to run it first. I have to run it. On that. This is where I'm going to need some assistance. There you go. This is a pretty funky tool. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, weak, right? Yeah. All right. <laughs> how are we going? So, yes, love. Uh, care are important, were important in bringing, in bringing me to Christ. Uh, but what we're here about tonight then is about apologetic method. It is an important subject. I, I take it it's important because I think we can derive the way we should do Christian apologetics from the things taught in the Bible. And so that's our subject. And I want to introduce this topic of apologetic method by uh, giving you a quote from uh, Bertrand Russell his uh, China teapot quote. It's a quote that uh, Richard Dawkins picks up in his book, The God Delusion, so it certainly captured people's attention. And Russell writes, I like this guy's surname, by the way. Yeah. Russell writes, I'm oh, Mike Russell, I guess you can pick that up. The mere quote, this is a quote, many orthodox people speak as though it were the business of sceptics to disprove received dogmas rather than of dogmatists to prove them. This, of course, is a mistake. 
If I were to suggest that between the Earth and Mars there is a China teapot revolving about the Sun in an elliptical orbit, nobody would be able to disprove my assertion, provided I were careful to add that the teapot is too small to be revealed even by our most powerful telescopes. But if I were to go on to say that since my assertion cannot be disproved, it is intolerable presumption on the part of human reason to doubt it, I should rightly be thought to be talking nonsense. If, however, the existence of such a teapot were affirmed in ancient books taught as the sacred truth every Sunday and instilled into the minds of children at school, hesitation to believe in its existence would become a mark of eccentricity and entitle the doubter to the attentions of the psychiatrist in an enlightened age or of the inquisitor in an earlier time. The issue at hand, then, is the burden of proof. Who has the burden of proof? Is it the theist who's trying to persuade an atheism to theism? Or, on the other hand, is it the atheist trying to persuade a theist to atheism? And what also about the Christian who's trying to persuade a theist to Christianity? Do they have the burden of proof? I remember first reading that quote from Russell in, in Richard Dawkins' book, and realising that I was unsure about who had the burden of proof in demonstrating God's existence, whether indeed I should be arguing for God's existence or not. If you've got some doubts in this area, or perhaps being here, you have some strong opinions in this area, well, this is the area of apologetic method that we're really looking at in aiming to answer such a question. Let me say that in the discipline of apologetics, there are various schools of thought, and I take it you may well be aware of them. Various schools of thought as to how the apologist should proceed and who has the burden of proof when contending for the truth of Christianity. There is even debate about how to categorise the various approaches, the various apologetic schools of thought. And in my view, the best way to categorise the apologetic position is by talking about an apologist's method of argumentation as opposed to talking about their proposed mode of knowing. So, let's have a think about that for a moment. Uh, there's a, an important book called Five Views on Apologetics, which is edited by uh, Stephen Cowan. And it's an example of a book, this is an important book, that uh, takes this approach to categorisation, namely of method of argumentation. What I want to do, and I'll show you these books at the end of my talk, but I want to use some of the labels from that book. It's an important book, as I say, uh, partly because it brings across five key thinkers, one of whom is William Lane Craig, a bit of a, a key man, I understand, for this group. But in his classical approach, as Craig's happy to be labelled, there are people as well like Thomas Aquinas and, he, and William Lane Craig, who take a, a two-stage approach to apologetic argumentation. They first argue for theism using the arguments of natural theology. Then secondly, move on to argue for Christian theism. Secondly, you have the evidential approach, exemplified by Gary Habermas and others, where the focus falls especially on arguments for Jesus' resurrection so that the attempt is made to prove the truth of Christian theism in one step. There is one argument, so that there is no need to first argue for God's existence before moving to Christian claims. Another approach is commonly called presuppositionalism, with Cornelius Van Til as its fountainhead. He's followed by the likes of Greg Barnson, Scott Oliphant and John Frame. This is quite a, a recent approach. Van Til himself only died in 1987. Uh, these presuppositionalists insist that there is no neutral ground from which we may sit back and question God's existence or Christian claims. For that reason, they insist that the whole Bible should be presupposed by the Christian apologist. And yet, they do argue for God's existence. They do argue for the Bible's truth from the impossibility of the contrary. And that means that their method usually involves showing the illogicality of, the, of their opponent's position. Yet another apologetic <coughs> method popularised in recent years is termed Reformed Epistemology. Following Albert Plantinga, 
This method particularly emphasises the fact that arguments and evidence are not needed for Christian theism to be reasonable or justified. A final approach worth mentioning is championed by the likes of Karl Barth, who denounces apologetics altogether and argues that the Christian gospel should simply be proclaimed and believed. Now I want to point out that there are other ways to categorise one's approach to apologetics which are, in my view, flawed or incomplete. A very popular approach is to categorise each method according to its understanding of the relationship between faith and reason. Paul Helm, for example, has, has an important book called Faith and Reason. And he says that there are three main ways to understand the relationship between faith and reason in the history of apologetics. The first is to say that it is necessary, or at least possible, to give reasons for belief in God and the Scriptures. And you'd include Aquinas, Butler, Paley, Craig, Habermas, and many others here. The second understanding says that it is necessary, or at least possible, to show the consistency of the world with what we find in the Bible. This is described as the tradition of faith-seeking understanding. And Augustine and Calvin did here. Lastly, there are those who eschew the use of reason and arguments in establishing the truth of the Bible. And here again you can place Bart, perhaps Luther, Kierkegaard. Now the problem here is that many major thinkers are hard or impossible to categorise. Van Til and Plantinga, for example, are hard to place. They're examples of people who provide arguments for God's existence, yet they also presuppose much. It's very difficult to place them in exactly in their relationship between uh, faith and reason. They say a lot more than simply about the mode of knowing. Uh, a third, even blunter categorization of apologetic method is to simply speak of evidentialism and presuppositionalism as two polar options with perhaps a continuum between them. This is the way my apologetics lecturer uh, taught it. Uh, now, Craig and Aquinas clearly fit under evidentialism, and Barth and Kierkegaard under presuppositionalism, but uh, far too many thinkers are too hard to categorise as evidentialist or presuppositionalist. What I want to propose for us tonight is a fresh approach to apologetic method, which I call no excuse intuitionism. Now, as I outline this method, I hope it will become clear why the categorizations involving faith and reason, or evidentialism and presuppositionalism, are flawed. And the answer is that they fail to specify faith and reason regarding what kind of truths. Evidentialism or presuppositionalism regarding what kind of truths. They leave no room for different apologetic approaches to different kinds of truths because they specify mode of knowing without specifying the content to which that mode of knowing should be applied. What then is this method of no excuse intuitionism? In no excuse intuitionism, the apologist should argue for some truths and presuppose others. That is, he should use an evidentialist style method when certain kinds of truths are in dispute, and a presuppositionalist style method when others are in dispute. The truths which should be presupposed, this is a key sentence. I don't know if there's anyone taking notes there, so that always pleases the speaker's heart. This, this is the bit to write down. The truths which should be presupposed are those moral truths which we need to know in order to live a blameless life. I'll say that again. The truths which we should presuppose are those moral truths which we need to know in order to live a blameless life. The truths, on the other hand, which should be argued for are the other truths of the Bible, in as much as they can be argued for. There are some that just, frankly, can't be argued for apart from arguing for the truth of the Scripture as a whole. There are all sorts of uh, obscure persons whose existence would be basically impossible to argue for because they are only mentioned in the Bible and nowhere else 
Nevertheless, the truths that should be argued for are the other truths of the Bible in as much as they can be argued for. Now, what do I mean by moral truths? Well, I mean the moral law a person needs to know to live a blameless life. And I also mean the various other truths which we might not normally call moral, but which we need to know to be able to live a morally blameless life. For example, I mean the moral truth that people should not steal. And I mean the associated moral truth that there are such things as possessions, which we must know to know the moral truth that we should not steal. As another example, I mean the moral truth that people should honour God and give Him thanks, as well as the associated moral truth that God exists which must be known to know the moral truth that we should honour God and give Him thanks. A third example. I mean the moral truth that people should not fornicate and the associ associated moral truth that marriage is a union of lifelong promise between a man and a woman, which must be known to know the moral truth that we should not fornicate. And what I'm saying is that such moral truths should be presupposed by the apologist in apologetic debate. But how? How can you presuppose those things? I think we're going to have questions at the end. So, okay. Right. Yeah. This is true. We need to get through <laughs> some material before we come to questions, and hopefully things will become clear as we proceed. What do I mean when I say that we should presuppose those moral truths? What I'm saying should not be done is to make positive arguments for these moral truths. We should not argue for these moral truths in such a way that we expect someone who is persuaded by our arguments to be persuaded with that argument as the ground of their new belief. For example, I should not argue against the practice of idolatry using statistics about outcomes for those who worship idols in such a way that it would be logical for the newly persuaded opponent of idolatry to ground their new belief on those statistics. What I can rightly do, however, is to argue for the consistency of these moral truths with the world we live in. So I can rightly use statistics regarding the outcomes of those who worship idols to point out that what we see in the world is consistent with what we already ought to know through intuition. Namely, that we should not commit idolatry. Such a right use of statistics could be seen as the method of faith-seeking understanding, or perhaps negative apologetics, dismissing a potential anti-Christian claim such as idolatry has no negative effects on a person. As a second example, I should not argue for God's existence using the fine-tuning teleological argument in such a way that it would be logical for the newly persuaded theist to ground their theism on my argument. What I can rightly do, however, is to argue for the consistency of the fine-tuning of the universe with the God we know to be the fine-tuner. So I can rightly use the scientific findings relating to the fine-tuning of the universe to point out that the world we have found is consistent with God's existence, as we should have expected. Again, such an argument could be seen in the tradition of faith seeking understanding. Or, alternatively, as negative apologetics, dismissing a potential atheistic claim such as the world does not bear the marks of God's creation. Indeed, it could be seen as an approach showing the reasonableness of faith in God. A fine phrase indeed. Reasonable faith. So, we have seen which truths should be presupposed, and what I mean that an apologist should presuppose a certain truth. Which truth then should be argued for? Well, I'm saying that an evidential style should be used for all other truths of the Bible. For example, the truth that Jesus lived, died and was raised should be argued on a historical basis. 
the truth that these things win our forgiveness should be argued for using a combination of the prophecies of the Old Testament and the historical witnesses to what Jesus said and did. I do commend, for example, the approach of Gary Habermas and his minimal facts approach to proving Jesus' resurrection. I commend such work except at the point where Jesus' resurrection is used to prove the moral truths that we should already know, such as that God exists. In the approach I'm recommending, the apologist then should use an evidential approach for some questions and a presuppositionalist approach for others. And key in the derivation of the need for two different methods is the doctrine of no excuse. That is, the truths which should be presupposed should be presupposed because individually they can and ought be understood through intuitions. And they can and ought be understood through intuitions because such intuitionism is the only method of knowing such truths which is sufficiently simple that it is accessible to all. If the knowledge were not available simply mm -hmm. and instead an argument were required, mm -hmm. people would have an excuse before God for not living a totally blameless life. The excuse would be that God hadn't made his moral requirements sufficiently clear that they could be understood by all. Let me put that around the other way. It takes a bit of getting your head around that. Yeah, that makes sense, though. I I'm all for encouragement from the, uh, <laughs> the audience, the congregation. In church, in my church, you never get an amen, brother. But uh, I don't mind those kinds of churches, or indeed those kind of audiences. Let me put it around the other way. The Apostle Paul tells us we are without excuse for our moral failings. This implies that all people ought to know the moral truths they need to know to avoid moral failings. This implies that each such moral truth is able to be known in simple fashion without the need for evidence or complicated argument. And this in turn implies that each such moral truth is able to be known by all through intuition. Hence, no excuse intuitionism. That is, the concept of no excuse points to the logic supporting the fact that we should presuppose those moral truths a person needs to know to live a blameless life. A little more detail is helpful here to ensure I'm saying what the Apostle Paul is saying or implying in Romans 1. I propose... Actually, I was going to read Romans 1 at the end, but why don't we just have a bit of a break now, and I'll read you Romans 1 now. I'll pick it up at verse 17. For in the Gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. For the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man, and birds, and animals, and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity, for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, 
The men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. Furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They are senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. You, therefore, have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge the other, you are condemning yourself, because you who pass judgment do the same things. Now, the argument that I'm making here hinges in part on Paul's teaching. The people are without excuse for their moral failures. We just saw that in the text of Romans, where Paul says that people are without excuse for suppressing the truth by their wickedness, in verse 18. For failing to glorify God as God, in verse 21. For failing to give thanks to Him, in verse 21. For exchanging the glory of God for images, verse 23. Now all of these are moral failures. They are deeds, or lack of deeds. And Paul implies that they are immoral deeds when he says that God punished them. Some of the punishments that God sent mankind for these moral failures were handing people over to further evils, as we just read in verse 24 to 32, to shameful lusts in verse 26, to a depraved mind in verse 28. But the fact that there was a punishment at all indicates both that they had failed morally and that they should have known that they had failed morally. The doctrine of no excuse here is a doctrine of no excuse for mankind's moral failures. And that's key in the logic that I spelt out just a moment ago. A second key in the logic that I spelt out was that Romans 1 implies a generic ethical intuitionism. Now, Robert Audi defines intuition. Robert Audi, by the way, is probably the leading proponent of ethical intuitionism. Not a Christian guy. And he defines intuitionism as an ethical theory to be, in outline, I'm quoting here, in outline and in a minimal version, the view that there is at least one moral principle that is inferentially and intuitively knowable. Yes, we've got that. Further, Audi defines generic intuitionism as the stronger view on which there is a group of at least several such moral <coughs> principles. And what I'm saying is that the doctrine of no excuse implies this latter generic intuitionism. Now, one key way to see this is the fact that truths which all people are supposed to know must be knowable in simple fashion. That's what I've already argued. But additionally, notice that Paul speaks in Romans 1 of a certain mode of knowledge, namely the mode of understood from what has been made. The mode of knowledge of moral truths is thus explicitly a question addressed in, moral, in Romans 1. <clears throat> Romans 1 is teaching about a simple mode of knowledge. Now, in modern ethical parlance, we can say that Paul is teaching a, generic, a general ethical intuitionism. People look at the world around them and at themselves and simply apprehend various moral truths, apart from any <coughs> argument based on any evidence. So, for example, you don't need me to present evidence or argument that you should honour your mother and father. You should just know it. And if you object that 
that is not the case. I am not required, I in fact ought not, and I certainly need not, try to persuade you by a long list of what might happen if you don't honour your father and mother. You should just not, through your intuitions. Similarly, that you should not kill, that you should not rise up if you do not like what I am saying and kill me, is something you ought to know by intuition, apart from needing to make any arguments. And there are any number of things which, with which I think you're going to agree with me if I trot them out and bring before you various kinds of moral claims. You will agree with me, I take it, that you don't need, and you ought not need, an argument to believe such a moral claim that we should not torture children for fun it is not something you need an argument to be persuaded of, nor should you need an argument. Now, I'm following Paul, the Apostle, and extending that line of reasoning to all the moral knowledge we need to know to live a blameless life. We ought to know it all through intuitions. Why should any mode of knowledge be different just because the object of that knowledge is contentious? Why should what I'm saying suddenly become different because at the moment such a claim is contentious among humans? I don't think that changes. The fact that we ought to know the moral truth we need to know to live a blameless life through intuitions. Now, of course, this mode of knowing needs to have caveats attached. And because of the effects of sin, no person is able to intuit correctly every moral truth they need to know. Our consciences all produce faulty intuitions at times. And further, without the Scriptures and the testimony of the Spirit, no person is able to determine which of their intuitions are faulty. Mm. Yet, in spite of those caveats, it remains the case that different people, without access to the Scriptures, can and have understood each individual moral truth which they need to know to live blamelessly, through their intuitions. As Romans 1 says, since the creation of the world, God's eternal power and divine nature have been understood from what has been made. There is a mode of knowledge that is real, that has functioned to bring many people to many true moral viewpoints, and it continues to do so. And it must be reckoned with in any true account of apologetic men. Well, we've seen then that Paul's doctrine of no excuse allows the apologist to rightly presuppose those moral truths which it is necessary to know to live a blameless life. But now I want to demonstrate more, namely that if these truths are positively argued for, the doctrine of no excuse is undermined. Think more closely about what will happen if an apologist makes a positive argument for truths he should presuppose. Think about what happens when he puts an argument expecting that that argument could persuade a person to that moral belief. If the apologist is successful, the person's newfound moral belief will rest on that argument. But in that case, it will be logical for the person to say that others have an excuse for not believing that moral truth. The excuse that they never heard the argument which persuaded them of that moral truth. Put another way, the mistake is to present arguments for beliefs that should be in the foundations of a person's network of beliefs. When such an argument is made, it is logical that a person persuaded by the argument will end up with beliefs in the first or upper floors of their network of beliefs, when that belief should in fact be in the foundations, should be in the things presupposed. So, for example, if the apologist argues that God exists on the basis of the Kalam cosmological argument and is successful in persuading a person that God exists, it would be logical to expect that person to have grounded their newfound theism in that argument. But this means that this person's beliefs regarding the physics of the beginning of the universe are likely to be supporting his belief in God in his network of beliefs. 
And this in turn will mean that it will be logical for him to deny the doctrine of no excuse. There will be a robust logic in him reasoning that many will not have heard the cosmological argument that persuaded him to theism. And without that argument, he himself would not be theistic. And so he can logically conclude that many people have an excuse for not being theistic. Namely, not ever having heard the argument that persuaded him to theism. Now such a result should be avoided. The apologists should avoid approaches that logically lead their dialogue partner to deny parts of scripture. In the area of ethics, it is even clearer that we should not argue on the basis of evidence. This is because when the apologist argues for a moral truth he should presuppose, he implies ethical consequentialism. That's bad, in case you didn't know. Mm. If he argues against fornication on the basis of health outcomes, he implies that if the health outcomes related to fornication improve or change, then fornication might cease to be immoral or might become more immoral. That is to imply that health statistics determine the morality of fornication. It's a form of consequentialism, ethical consequentialism, where the ends justify the means. It is to be rejected. So, I've outlined why the apologist should presuppose certain truths and what those truths should be. It's now time to defend the point that arguments should be made and evidence should be provided regarding other biblical claims, especially the claims of the Gospel. And by the claims of the Gospel, I mean the claims about Jesus, that he died and rose again as the Christ, that he dealt with the guilt and power of our sin on the cross according to the Old Testament Scriptures. Now when the unbelievers are hearing the Gospel for the first time, there are some elements of scriptural teaching that they ought to know and presuppose already, and some which they can be ignorant of or even disbelieve for a period of time without being culpable. For while unbelievers ought to believe indefeasibly all the elements of the universal moral law, or at least those elements they've heard and understood, it is not the case that they ought to believe all the historical elements of the Bible and the Gospel indefeasibly. The noble Bereans of Acts 17, 11 to 12, were right not to immediately believe the historical elements of Paul's claims, but to test them. They would only be justified in believing the great things of the gospel indefeasibly after the Holy Spirit had testified to their spirits individually that they were the children of God through the gospel. Before this event, historical evidences are useful and required because it is the historical elements of the scripture that unbelievers can be rightly ignorant of and dubious about before testing them and hearing them and weighing the arguments. Only after conversion is it right for a person to presuppose the gospel and its saving effect for them. So take the example of a man in the process of being converted to Christianity, having heard the gospel. The order of the events in the man's heart will be that he first trusts in Jesus, enabled by God through the Gospel and the Holy Spirit to do so. Then second, he receives the Holy Spirit as a deposit of guarantee with the result that the Spirit testifies to him that he is a child of God and an heir of eternal life. And third, he then, at that point, ought to believe indefeasibly that inward testimony of the Holy Spirit to him. Namely, then he ought to believe indefeasibly the great things of the Gospel and that Jesus' death was effective for him personally. Now when considering that order in salvation, it can be seen that for the man who rejects the Gospel, he is not at fault in the first instance for failure to believe the Gospel message which does not warrant immediate belief. Rather, he is at fault for not prayerfully and diligently examining the scriptures to see if the gospel might be true, like the Bereans did in Acts 17. For those who do examine the scriptures in such fashion, 
The promise is that God will honour that search appropriately. As James says, come near to God and he will come near to you. Orbe is by way of showing that the presupposition of the gospel is not appropriate for every person. It is not appropriate for unbelievers. From the unbelievers' side, they ought to consider the evidence for the gospel's claims. From the apologist's side, we ought to provide the evidence for the gospel's claims. What I'm doing here, in case you missed it, is arguing against the view of Van Til and his so-called presuppositionalist followers. I'm not going to labour this point because I doubt we have in this room any Van Tilian presuppositionalists. You get them more in America. But hear me clearly, they are misguided in presupposing the whole scripture in every apologetic context and debate. Now with that grand couple, just trying to work out if I'm on the right slide. I'm not sure whether it went. That's, that's new one, yeah. Good. With that ground covered, I hope you can see more clearly why it is a mistake to categorise apologetic methods using the faith reason paradigm or the presuppositionalist evidentialist paradigm. Both of those paradigms categorise an apologetic method solely by its method of knowing. In one case, the focus is on the interaction between faith and reason as methods of knowing. And in the other case, the focus is on the decision between presuppositionalism and evidentialism as methods of knowing. The problem is that in both cases, such a categorization fails to spell out what kinds of knowledge are rightly known through each method of knowing. The biblical approach of no excuse intuitionism is not able to be described in terms of the relationship between faith and reason or on a spectrum between presuppositional belief and evidential belief. And that is enough to discard both of those paradigms for describing the different apologetic approaches. Cowan is right in his book, Five Views on Apologetics, to categorise apologetic approaches by method of argumentation rather than by mode of knowledge. I wasn't on the right side. In conclusion, I call my method, my approach to apologetics, no excuse intuitionism. Because the division over which truth should be argued for and which not derives from Paul's doctrine of no excuse. We've seen that Romans 1 says that we are without excuse for our moral failures. We've seen that Romans 1 implies an ethical intuitionism. That is, we ought to know through intuitions the moral truths we need to know to live a blameless life. We've seen further that when such moral truths are argued for, the doctrine of no excuse is undermined. We've seen that when moral laws are argued for, ethical consequentialism is implied, and that's bad. But we've seen that the evidence for gospel claims in particular should be provided by apologists. And further, We've seen that unbelievers can rightly, at least at first, disbelieve the claims of the gospel and subject those claims to testing. In sum, we've seen that a hybrid of presuppositionalism and evidentialism is what is required. What then should we say to Bertrand Russell? We should say yes, there are some truths which require testing. The orbiting tiny teapot is such a truth. So is the death and resurrection of Jesus. But there are other truths which we should accept on the basis of the moral intuitions God gives us. Just one of those is the truth that God exists. This is the reply according to no excuse intuitionism. I commend it as the biblical apologetic approach. Thank you very much. What I think we'll do, I think we'll break for supper, mm -hmm. uh, so you can turn that off if you like, and then we'll um, have a discussion after.